Hello everybody, welcome back to Garibaldi Reds as Forest draw to Crystal Palace. 1-1 one, one after the international break. Forest come into the game with, of course, the points deduction and all of the noise and news surrounding the football club. But Forest earn a point, possibly a valuable point, which we will get on to discuss in a moment. Thanks to a Chris Wood trademark goal. It's not really a Chris Wood trademark goal, actually, really, is it? Uh, what a beautiful header. Absolutely class header watching it in the stands. Eight out of 11 for him now. What a stat and what a vital player he's becoming for Forest. Uh, I will add, as as we are recording this, it is straight after the game on Saturday night. Uh, I appreciate this person for joining me during a bank holiday weekend, which seems like everybody's off and everybody's doing things. Uh, but Mark Turner joins us, Forest Fancast, all the way from the States. Mark, thanks for deciding that you're not going to have a bank holiday weekend rest and be with us on Garibaldi Red. No problem. I'm happy to take a break from consuming chocolate to hang out with you, Max. Always a pleasure. Thank you. I don't know. I might actually, do you know, the, as we're recording this, the Easter eggs are sat right next to me. And I'm tempted oh. just to break one out halfway through if things get if, a bit. If, things if get you do. Yeah, if you do, I'm making a bolt for the Cadbury's cream eggs. It'll be fair dues. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, uh, <laughs> that's made me laugh actually about Easter. <laughs> Let's um, let's uh, let's let's start with with our initial thoughts from the game. I was there, Mark. Obviously, um, you weren't you you were at home, but but watched the game in the states. What did you make of it? Because it really was. I mean, we were just touching on this before we kind of started the recording. It really was a game of two halves, wasn't it? At the City Ground today. Yeah, absolutely. It was that you know that terrible cliche. One of the most famous in football, right? Like you said, game of two halves. Um, I could hear my own stupid words ringing in my own ample ears after the first half. Uh, last time I was on with you, I talked about the lack of cohesion, the fact we don't look like a team, that we really need to pull that together if we have any chance of survival. And in that first 45 minutes, it was really more of the same, wasn't it? Um, and then, of course, some personnel changes and some tactical changes, which I'm sure we're going to get into, really seemed to turn the tide for us in the second half. And we saw a team that was comfortable in possession, we saw a team that was putting um, the opposition under a great deal of pressure, albeit with, with still too few clear-cut chances, um, but definitely positive. And I think a point was the very least that Forrest deserved. Uh, yeah, they did. Of course, Palace was scoring quite early on and then uh, sparked a little bit of reaction from Forrest. But at half-time, there was a few boos and struggle to know whether that's aimed at the referee a lot of the time but um but it seemed like it was aimed at, at, at the players and, and and Nuno as they kind of went off but you know you're right second half came out a little bit more fight not as probably not as much as maybe I think a lot of fans would have wanted given where we are we'll kind of talk about that and, and touch on that but when you look at the game kind of on a whole mark and you think kind of Forrest come into it with almost that should have been siege mentality, a, a display from Forza Garibaldi before the game and a, and a, and a you know, a good atmosphere. And Forrest released his pre-match video last night of Nuno to telling the fans to bring the noise. And the fans certainly did bring the noise today. Just a shame we couldn't get all three points. But there is almost that, all that speculation surrounding the game today. I mean, did you expect Forrest to use that siege mentality and did you see it at all? Um, I mean, especially in the second half. Yeah, no, you touch on a great point. I mean, we talked previously, hadn't we, about the impact that the points reduction had had on Everton and were we going to see something similar from Forrest? I enjoyed the video that was released, although I'd say, you know, boys, even though you're not playing particularly well this season, definitely stick to your day jobs. <laughs> I'm not sure a career on camera was for any of the guys who participated in that video. Nevertheless, it was good to see the we'll stick to that. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, the Forza Garibaldi display. I mean, that was absolutely magnificent. Uh, I had a tear in my eye, actually, sat here in Colorado watching it on TV. Um, it definitely made all the emotions swell. Um, and no, I didn't see that on the field, though, Max, again, particularly in the first half. And I, I think this has been something that has been um, a distinguishing mark of this team throughout this season. And that is they, they do seem to be playing with fear. I mean, we saw it once we start to hit that slippery slope with Steve Cooper, nobody seemed to want to take ownership of the ball. People were hiding. Um, there, there just appeared to be a high degree of, of kind of fear factor. Nuno came in, the players appeared to be reinvigorated for the first couple of games, seemed to be playing with a, a new degree of freedom and, 
kind of a swashbuckling approach to things. And then that soon abated. And now we're back to kind of players on their heels again and trying to soak up pressure and catch the opposition on the counter-attack. And I think that's what made the second half somewhat optimistic in that Forrest did seem to be on the front foot, maybe not to the degree, like you said, that, that the folks in the stadium wanted wanted to see, but it, it was definitely a sea change. Um, and the players, mm. they, they, they appeared to be playing with a, a heightened degree of determination. So that's encouraging. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and especially given eight cup finals left and, and albeit, you know, today was one, which Forrest didn't really capitalise on. Seven, seven plus City. Oh, is it seven? Is it seven? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> seven plus City. And maybe Tottenham if you take Tottenham out. But, but you never know. Do you know what? It'd be the most... I was actually saying this to a mate before we started this. I was on the phone to him. If it would be the most Forest thing to do would be to beat City and, lo- and lose to Sheffield United or Burnley or something on the final yeah. day. Um, yeah. It would be just classic, classic Nottingham Forest. Let's go back to the first half and especially the team selection. Quite a few changes. <laughs> probably not the best to change and not the best team he started with Nuno. Uh, Origi on the right, um, you know, Alanga obviously uh, found himself on the bench, Sangari, which will dominate headlines and we will get on to in a minute. But in terms of the team selection as a whole, did you feel like it was wrong from the start and he kind of corrected that at half time? You, you could almost say he kind of owned up a little bit given given the changes of personnel at the um, at the break. Yeah, I mean, let's let's come on to that in just a second. I do want to, you know, staying on this thread of trying to be optimistic and upbeat. Uh, I, I mentioned that I could hear my own words ringing in my ears in regards to the lack of cohesion in that first half. I also made the point the last time I was on the show that in addition to players like Morgan Gibbs White and Murillo, who have been outstanding this season by and large, there are a couple of other players who I feel like have, have gone really under the radar and deserve some kudos. One was Nico Williams, who didn't have his best game today, but again, I thought he was solid and provided, I mean, defensively, he looked good and again, provided uh, a, an offensive outlet as well. Um but also really, really impressed with Matt Sells. And again, somebody I've mentioned in the previous the previous show, um, he's gone under the radar for me. And I think he's been an absolute upgrade on everything else we have, um, kind of in the goalkeeping uh, bullpen, to use American vernacular, because let's drop one of those in every episode. Um, but he had a fantastic game today. He made a couple of really, really outstanding saves. In regards to the lineup, Matt, I mean, I don't know what what was the what were the words on the what you know what were you guys saying on the terraces? I mean, for certainly online and in our mm. WhatsApp group, folks were scratching their heads trying to understand. You know, for the last couple of weeks, people have been saying, "Why is Origi starting ahead of Hudson Odoi?" <laughs> now, folks are saying, "Why is he starting ahead of Alanga?" That being said, when Alanga came on, I mean, he was anonymous. He didn't have his best game today, that's for sure. But no, starting Origi, yeah, starting Origi over either of them seems bizarre. And um, so, so what did you hear on the terraces? And also, I'd be curious to hear what people are saying about Sangare. Yeah, I think it's interesting you say that actually about Origi starting over, over Bolton Adoy, and then and then today Alanga, and and that's exactly what people said. I was speaking to a few people actually before I took my seat at the game, and it was just it was just it was just questionable. It's you know we talk about consistency of a team selection. Again, there's no consistency of that team selection. You know, for me, Divock Origi. I have to ask the question, what does he offer? You know, um, and, and and especially playing him on the right. Yes, he has a little bit of pace at times, but there, there just was very, there was just a lot of missed up. Do you, do you disagree with him? Do, do you disagree with me there, Mark? You think he offers no, something a little bit different? I, I, di- I disagree oh. with you saying he has a little bit of pace. <laughs> I think he used to have a little bit of pace. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Maybe, maybe not after Christmas. Um, <laughs> but, so, but, you know, but a player like him, Coming from Liverpool, I keep mentioning it and going back to it, but he scored a goal in the Champions League final. You'd expect a little bit better from him. And there isn't anything there. He he, he just struggles with those final chances. It, you know, he kind of he gets the ball, picks it up. What does he do with it? That's the that's the big question for me. You could also relate that question to Sangari as well. You know, forty over forty million Forest played paid for him, record club signing. Use the money from the Brennan Johnson deal. What has Sangari done so far uh, that that deserves any plaudits? I'm struggling to pick any out on a Saturday yeah. evening. I can't lie to you, Mark. And I and I don't think I don't think the fans were happy with the team selection, you know, and performances from Sangari and Origi. Two changes he made. 
Yeah, uh, Sangari really is a head scratcher. 40 million, 14 appearances now. And I think I can remember one game where he really looked, you know, worth, worth the sticker price. And it's not fair to judge somebody based on that, you know, their, their, their transfer fee. They don't obviously have anything to do with that. But the transfer fee should speak to the quality of the individual, right? As, as the player is, and what they're going to bring to the team. And we felt like Sangare was going to bring something we didn't have in the squad currently. We felt like he was going to be a starter. We understood it might take him, you know, a handful of games to kind of get up to speed with the speed of the Premier League. Um, but, you know, I watched some of his games in the African Cup of Nations and he looked like, complete, like a completely different player. I, I don't know how much more how much more time you give him. I, had, I to be honest with you, Max, I had the same reservations about Mangala last season, and I was kind of getting close to the end of my tether, right around the, the time when he actually got good. <laughs> so um, I, I still have hope for Sangare, but I, if this were the start of the season, if we were eight games in, my patience and tolerance for what he's doing or not doing right now. You know, I could potentially extend that a little further. We're eight games from the end now, and it's crunch time. Um, and so I'm sure we're going to come on and talk about what happened second half in terms of personnel changes and tactical changes and what that might look like going forward. But um, yeah. I'm not saying throw Sangare to the walls. I'm not saying he's done. However, I am saying that about Rigi. I agree. I agree. Um I'm, I'm just I'm just struggling to to pluck out any positivity from Origi and probably Sangari. I, I just feel like you know 40 million, well over 40 million for a player, club record fee, as you say, Mark. He should live up to the fee, and it's not fair to judge him on that. But he, he's 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 just not. And at the moment, it is crunch time. You need players. You need fight. You need passion. Not just that. You need technical ability. Does Sangari offer either of those? Probably not. Let's look at the changes that he made at half-time, Nuno. And he must have said something pretty big at half-time because it really was a game of two halves and Forrest came out and got a goal thanks to a wonderful Chris Wood header, which we'll get on to. But the changes he made, and then also further on in the second half with Gio Reina coming on, as as someone that's um, someone that has a little bit of a connection to the States, Mark. I'm, I mean, in fact, we'll, we'll touch on Gio later, but what did you make of the personnel changes? That um, that he made, and then and then obviously Gio Reyna coming on later on. Yeah, so they were positive. I like seeing Nuno do things at half time, particularly when it had been such a wretched first half. Right, it, you get frustrated with managers. You sort of wait to that 60th, 65th minute. Like you've had forty five minutes to impose yourself on this game. That's more than enough. You know, it just it just seems to be. It's broken thinking to suggest that you should give a player who hasn't played well for 45 minutes more time only to then give his replacement 20 to 25 minutes to turn the game on its head. It's like you've had a half, you've done nothing, off you come. Um, and obviously fans have been talking both online and I think just you know generally across um, uh, social media about Morgan Gibbs-White dropping in to accommodate Rayner, who then went into the number 10 spot. Fans might remember Steve Cooper did that a few times with Morgan Gibbs White kind of putting him back into a more traditional, I guess you call it like an eight position and having him yeah. play not flat alongside the eights, but certainly he was deeper. quite deep there, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was. And here's what I'd say about that. And if you remember at the time, fans love that. And they were like, stick with that. Keep Morgan in there. And it was a slightly different situation. Cause again, you might remember Morgan was stuck out wide at the time. Right. And so we just wanted to bring him more central. My contention when it comes to Morgan Gibbs White is get him on the ball. He did not have a good first half, but he's one of those players who never hides, right? If he has a bad touch, he's up on his feet and he's trying to create another angle and he's barking for that ball again, right? He wants it again, even though he just got dispossessed or whatever may have happened. Um, he is the most influential play, player on our team. He's the one that can unlock defences with a pass, as he did today. And there are others that can do that too, but he's the one who does it most routinely, assuming the ball's moving, of course, and not from a set piece. Um, but get more, get Morgan on the ball more. Give him the ability to drop in and take the ball off the defenders. Give him the ability to slide and support the fo the fullbacks and link up in that regard. And then by by dropping him out of that ten position, you're taking the pressure off him as well because defenders are gonna, naturally going to get sucked to Chris Wood. They're also going to try and pinch in as well and, and close out any space in which the ten might operate. Allowing Morgan to drop in a little deeper gives him the opportunity to pick his head up, 
you know, and, and pick a pass or carry the ball if he sees the opportunity. So I liked him back there. And I, I like Rayner coming in at 10 as well. And I'd love to talk to you a bit more about him as well and what he might offer. And maybe why he hasn't got more of a look in now, because I do have a theory in that regard. But yeah, like the changes and obviously they had the desired effect. Yeah, uh, Anthony Langer, of course, replacing Sangare and, you know, pushing that wide and then Origi came off uh, as he well later on. For Alanga Reina. wasn't effective though, was What happened with Alanga, do you think? What did you see in the stadium? <sighs> I just thought, I just thought, it, again, it was just a, but I think, I think, you know, Callum, again, Callum hudson Adoy is a player that sometimes can have games where he'll go quiet for 10 minutes and then he'll bring something to life and, and, and he'll, yeah. have that, he'll have that pace down the wing. And the same with Alanga, but for me, Alanga didn't, you know, he, as you touched on, he didn't do a great deal when he came on. Um, I don't, I, I don't know about Alanga because people call him a bit of a super sub. But for me, I, I think, I think you start him. Um, you know, he's a, he's a, he's done so well for Forest in the past. I, I just don't, and, and I, I don't really understand the decision for Nuno not to start him today. Um, and he's and, and Nuno is probably asking himself maybe that now. Who knows? Probably not. The one, the, um, the one thing I would say in Nuno's defence is. We don't see what happens on the training field, right? All week. Yeah. Um, and we and, and and when you're when you're out there training with players, and I, I played at a semi pro level, I coached more years than I care to remember at various different levels. And when you're coaching players, yes, you're coaching the individuals and you're wanting to see who shows up and gives you something, but you're also looking at combinations, you're looking at creating patterns, you're looking at which players. Uh, come alive during set pieces, right? In terms of movement and where they're drawing players away and the spaces they're creating for their teammates. It's it's a whole combination of things. And it may be this week that, for whatever reason, Alanga was just off the pace. And I think the one thing I would give Nudo credit for is, you know, if this is the case, you know, if he saw something in practice this week he didn't care for, is keep your players honest. You know what? Nobody with the possible exception of Murillo and, and well, Sal's Murillo and Morgan Gibbs-White, nobody should be guaranteed a starting place week in, week out, particularly in the predicament the team's in now. Everybody should be bringing their A game to, to, to training and, and then consequently to match day as well. So maybe Alanga didn't. Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a very good point, actually. Um, let's touch on Gio Reyna because you mentioned him there and and it is a player that a lot of fans, not just Forest fans, but American fans on Twitter, I seem to look at every single day and, and they're there kind of crying out, why aren't Forest playing Gio Reyna? Gio Reyna, but he's a highly rated American midfielder and he, you know, he costs a lot and, and his skills and, and when you actually break Reyna's career down, he did a, did a great job and and it is interesting that that, that, that Forrest have opted not to, to start him. He looked bright when he came on for me. He did make a little bit of a difference. But again, he had 15, 20 minutes to change a game. And as you alluded to earlier, Mark, it isn't a great deal of time. What do you make of him as a player? What did you make of him today coming on and being our American correspondent here at Garibaldi Red? <laughs> do you feel like we should be starting him more? What a title that is. You've gone international, Max, and it was only a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I've seen a lot of Gio Reyna. So I, I, I'm going to back up here quickly and say that I'm a big fan of his dad, Claudio Reyna. Um, my Scottish team is Glasgow Rangers. And actually, I've been following Rangers only a couple of years less than I've been following Forest. Uh, Forest is my very first team. But then once I started collecting stickers in my Panini album, I decided I needed a Scottish team to follow as well. And um, it yeah, gravitated to Rangers. Uh, Claudio Reyna ended up having a spell with Rangers, um, as well as, as some time, of course, in the um, uh, in England as well. Um, and, and then he ended up being the, um, the sporting director at Austin FC, who are my MLS team. So I was actually, I've, got, I've been in a room with Claudio Reyna. I've had a couple of quick conversations with him. So I have a lot of affection for that family. That being said, they haven't covered themselves in glory Recently, you might remember there was a contentious episode between the Rainers and um, and Greg Berhalter, the American uh, national men's national team coach during the last World Cup. Um, and some of that blowback, uh, re, uh, Gio saw some of that blowback as well. And there were suggestions that um, maybe he's a little up on himself, maybe not a team player, um, 
bit selfish. I don't know that any of this is true. It's all out there in the public zeitgeist. So it's not like I'm trying to like propagate myth here. It's out there. Mm. And whether it's true or not, you know, everyone's got a, a position on that. And so when I think about why uh, Geo may not gotten a look in at Forest until, I mean, sparingly, right? Uh, until today, I wonder if some of it might be to do with temperament. I wonder really how much of a say he had in the move to Forest. Obviously, we know the connection between his agent and, and Nuno. Um, and so you sort of wonder, you know, did he kind of did he kind of show up in Nottingham under duress almost? Um, but one thing I did notice is, is, is the few cameos that he's made, Max. He's been he's really played within himself. So this comes coming back back to my earlier issue of we've been playing with fear, right? Morgan Gibbs White is one of the very few players. Murillo is another. I think um, Nico Williams is another who will take the ball and try and do something with it, right? They're very positive. They go forward. Mm -hmm. Gio has that. I mean, he can unlock defences. He's a very technically good player. I mean, arguably, yeah, he is. he's on a play uh, on a par with um, with Pulisic for being the best player on the US men's national team right now. But yet, when he's made cameos for Forest and folks, if folks want to go back and watch, you know, the games he he appeared in and and, and sense check this, they'll see. He's been playing a ton of square balls. Everything has been safe. It's been backwards or it's been sideways. I haven't seen him carry the ball and I haven't seen him you know, try and – he has this move he, he pulls for, for the national team where he'll shift his weight to move a defender open to, to create a channel and then he'll ping passes through three or four defenders to set one of his teammates in behind the line. And I've just seen him play – very much within himself. And that might be to do with the coach. That might be to do with the you know, unfamiliar surroundings. It might be to do with the fact that he's feeling a bit burned right now after the whole Dortmund situation. But today I thought we saw evidence and it wasn't, he's not there yet, but today we saw evidence of, of you know, the real Geo Reyna and what he can bring and how he can kind of link things up. And I think he and Morgan appear to be on a similar wavelength. So I think that bodes well for us moving forwards. Yeah. I think that kind of, ties in quite nicely with my next question to you, Mark. And you do have to, you know, as much as we try and keep this 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 positivity going sometimes as <laughs> as fans and, and picking positives out of, of of draws, it was a game that Forrest could have done with winning today. Yes, we're outside the relegation zone on goal difference and yes, Luton lost. But it's one win in Forest at one win in ten since Man United for Forest. You know, it, it doesn't make great reading and and so many cup finals left, and still City and and, and Tottenham to play, and 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 all and all those other teams that are in and around with us at the minute. I just feel like at the moment, Mark, sat in the stands today, you know, yes, there's that kind of fight in <laughs> fight in stages and and team spirit. However, I just wonder sometimes it's it's the technical ability, it's the constant silly errors that that, that Forest seem to make. And, and, and I, I just think it, I just think it's slightly worrying. Um, and, and you know, we've touched on for ages about whether Forest will get relegated. But for me, the more and more it goes on, and, and the more and more that Forest struggle to to see out games, shall we say, or, or or even come back. You know, Palace were there for the taking today. We didn't capitalise on that. Mm. Is that a concern? And then I suppose that leads nice onto the question of: it, Are players like Gio Reyna almost a breath of fresh air? Is this someone that can make a difference and, and and bring new energy to a squad that's that's desperate for points? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say that Gio did enough today to um, to secure a starting place on Tuesday. Uh, I think that's kind of a coin toss, but I don't see any risk in starting him. Uh, when you look at the alternatives, particularly. So, um, but to your point, Max, you know, the last time I was on the show, we talked about that, about the, whether or not Forrest would survive. And you you pitched me one of your now famous, infamous, difficult questions and left me to wrestle with it, a, a, essentially around Forrest, whether Forrest would get relegated or not. And as I looked at the, the nine games, I did some quick math on the spot. Um, and I, I said I was struggling to see Forrest pick up more than 10 or 11 points. And in doing that maths, I was looking at Palace as a three-pointer, right? This is the game where I thought we would get the three points and we haven't. So now that shifts the onus to somewhere else. Um, and we're running out of games. And so it does, it really does concern me. Do I feel like there's enough in this team to get out of this, this mess? Yes. I think I saw glimpses of him in the second half today for the first time in quite some time. Um, I'm seeing a but lot of noise. The first off on... is a real. Got... No, the no, first no, off is a real worry. Yeah, it is. I think, yeah. I think the first off is a real worry, considering that you 
you've had a points deduction. You're mm-hmm. supposed to be using this as a siege mentality. You've had a great display before the game. The atmosphere's pumped up. The fans mm-hmm. have brought the noise. Where's the performance first off? Yeah, and I should apologise to viewers as well. Um, the lines on my face are because of my slatted lines. I'm not reporting to you from prison here, so <laughs> in, case, in case anyone's wondering. Um, now that would now now that would make an interesting. Uh, <laughs> <episode. laughs> you know, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of conversation online around. Well, all we have to do is pick up more points than Luton, and that may be true. But I also I, that concerns me. Like I think Luton are more of a team than we are right now. I think they have more spirit than we do right now. Um, if it's us versus Luton, in any scenario, whether that's we have to pick up more points than them or the last game is against them and winner takes all, any situation in which you pitch us against Luton right now really concerns me. So I still think, you know, it's a coin toss, the coin's in the air, but at least we saw some things in the second half today that give me some semblance of hope. Yeah. A little bit of hope, which you know we talk, talk about, about Chris Wood's header. Though, like, come on, let's get let's get positive. Yeah, let's get back to yeah, the yeah, header. yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's <laughs> before my final killer question. Let's talk about Chris Wood because that because that because that was that was a lovely header, wasn't it? And he's there, right place, right time. Eight out of eleven for him. Eight goals in eleven games. Yeah, great stat. Mm-hmm. Proving to become such a key Forest player. He was he was slagged off right at the start of his forest journey and and even criticised by many people, including me. I'll, I'll hold my hands up for that. But what a player he's becoming now with Ta- with Taiwo out with Origi, uh, being Origi, we're, we're relying on Chris Wood as our striker, and he's scoring mm. goals. Thank God. Yeah, he is. And again, not to blow my own, my own horn, but you know I'm going to because I get to so rarely. Uh, Chris Wood was another of those players I picked out the last time I was on the show. I said in the absence of Taiwo. Uh, one year, you know, Mr. Mr. Hobnobs himself. Um, Chris Wood is absolutely central to our ability to score goals. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you remember, I, I pointed out that he's one of the few players who makes good decisions more often than not, and more often than not can execute on them. Not always. And we know he had a frustrating stretch when he came on board and fans were getting on his back, but he's proving he has pedigree. You know, he's New Zealand's top goal scorer, international top goal scorer for a reason. Um, I think they got, you're right. The goal he took today was that's really hard. Like what he did there, the speed with which he scanned the space, the kind of the um, the skill it took to determine what it was going to need to get that flick on over Henderson and under the bar. I mean, all of that is um, is top top quality stuff, and we're very lucky to have him right now. Um, if, if you know, if it weren't for Chris Wood, Lordy, I don't know where we'd be. Yeah. We'd be in trouble. We would be mm-hmm. in trouble. Final killer question. Oh, God, Mark, here we go. Brace here yourself. we go. Coming across, uh, across the we not just, it's, it's Easter. Can we just not have, do you prefer cabbage cream eggs or mini eggs? I mean, just, just to throw me a Which softball. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> Which one do you prefer? Cabbage cream <laughs> eggs or the mini eggs? It is cabbage cream eggs only by virtue of the fact that if you eat one cream egg, if you've, it's, it's kind of pretty sickly, right? And you're not, you're not going to get your second one. But if you give me a bag of mini yeah. eggs, oh my, you don't know where it's going to stop. That's the best. Fantastic. I got that from, I got that from my mum and dad, so I'm going to crack it. I'm not, say, I'm going to crack that open. What? You should say what? other Easter eggs are available. Yes, we should, by the way, in case we get back to branding. That's true. Cadbury's, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you want to sponsor the podcast, feel free. You know where we are. Um, follow us on Twitter, Garibaldi Red underscore. Um, so, yeah, other Easter eggs are available. Let's deliver the killer question. And my killer question to you, Mark, is as I'm sat in the stands and there's a minute 30 seconds left of the six that was added on by the referee, Oh, Willard, I actually thought I had a decent performance today. Credit where credit is due. There was 30 seconds, a minute left, and the Forest players are playing it around at the back instead of pumping the ball into the box and, and just throwing everything at at Crystal Palace. You, you're in a relegation dogfight. Come on, Forest, get the ball in the box. You're in the dire moments of a game. You've got the fans going absolutely mad to, 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 to drive the ball into the back of the net. We didn't do that. We were messing around with it for ages. And I just feel moments like that make me doubt Forrest's chance of survival. And I don't know about you, Mark, but I just question sometimes the players that are playing for Forrest at the minute, you know, whether the, 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 there is that connection. And it comes from the manager as well. You know, Nuno can be kind of, not to blame, but in part of this. Do they know what it really means to the fans to survive in the Premier League this season? 
and moments like that at the end of the game just make me feel that they they don't. Mm. That feels more like an observation. Good killer question. question. (laughs) (laughs) Observation turn question. Come on, answer it for me and then I'll let you go and have your Easter egg. I I think, you know what, actually, I I think I've already answered it in as much as I see a lot of fear in this team. And I've seen, Mm. I think we've seen it throughout the season. We didn't start the season with it, but it's definitely built. And so I think when you're in a situation where it's 1-1, where you're just trying to get points off the board off of a four-point deduction, you know, you've slipped into the relegation zone, one point will probably get you the right side of that line again, albeit temporarily. Uh, I wonder how many players out there are thinking, I, I I can't screw up. I don't want to be the one that pumps the ball forward or you know tries to carry it past somebody and gets it gets it pinched off him and all of a sudden we're under pressure. Um, yes, as fans we want to see Forest attack, attack, attack. We want to see them go for that winning goal in the ninety sixth minute. Um, but I do wonder whether or not I, 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 you can't really point the I mean, maybe you can point the finger at Nuno. I don't know where that fear originates, but that's what it looks like to me. And I could be way off base. Those players can be full of confidence right now. Um, But it did look to me like that, again, nobody wanted to make a mistake. They wanted to hold on to the one point. Um, You know, and Palace did have chances. And and I said earlier in, Mm. in, in in this episode, Max, as much possession as we had in the second half, as good as we looked going forward in bursts, we didn't create a whole lot clear cut. So there's still work to be done there as well. But, um, but I think, you know, nothing changes mentality like a win, right? We know football is about momentum, momentum within a game and momentum from game to game, right, across the season. And right now, Forrest don't have any. And I think if we can get a win on Tuesday, off the back now of having got a point against Palace, we can start to build some momentum and grow in confidence, then maybe we'll start to see the Nottingham Forest that everyone in the stands is rightly and understandably baying for. Spot on, spot on. We need a win. Tuesday yep. is such a big game. I mean, I, I mean, every game is a big game. We keep talking about it, but they it are is. wins They're for Forest at the moment. Hey, before we go, can, we, can, I, just, can I just give are. this a shout out? Just, just very of quickly. Of course, Mark, go for it. I was just going to introduce it. You took oh, the words good. Well. Go on. Okay, fantastic. Well, I see we're on the same wavelength. Unbelievable. So yeah, yeah anyway, I, I have this right here, folks. Um, of course, um, in honour of, of Larry. Spotify and- yeah, for oh, yes, Spotify Mark, yeah. And, and Apple Podcast listeners, uh, Mark has a lovely picture of the Forest European Cup winning team that was that, that was signed by Brian Clough sat behind him. Indeed, absolutely. Yeah, on the backdrop of a, a shirt from 1980. And of course, this is all um, to kind of commemorate Larry Lloyd and his passing this week at um, 75 years old. Larry Lloyd, of course, one of the miracle men, um, one of the, uh, the Not Your Forest players who won the European Cup in, in 79 and 80 um, with that incredible team that Brian Clough had put together. Uh, Lloyd played 443 times professionally across five teams. Of course, we know about Liverpool and Forest. Also played for Bristol Rovers, Coventry City and Wigan Athletic. Managed Wigan, Wigan Athletic for a short spell as well, as well as them folks across the river at Notts County. Um but will be best known for being one of the miracle men and an absolute stalwart at the heart of Forrest's defence. And anyone who can see this picture, or maybe even has a copy of this picture because it's available in the club shop, my word, what a man, Larry Lloyd. He's as wide as he was tall. It's unbelievable. He's an absolute beast. I've forgotten how big he was. He makes Peter Short look like a dwarf. It's ridiculous. So um, <laughs> man mountain in the middle of our defence, but not all, not not just purely physical Um uh, could pl- uh, make a pass as well, had great vision and really held things together back there. Him and, and Kenny Burns and, and Peter Shilton. Um, yeah, that was the foundation of everything that then uh, that took place further up the field. So uh, very, very sad to lose another of our miracle men after losing Trevor Francis earlier in the year. Um, so just want to make sure we take a quick minute to uh, to say our thoughts and prayers and uh our good vibes all go the way of, of uh, Larry Lloyd's family and uh, very much appreciate what he did for Nottingham Forest. 
Yeah, 100% echo all those thoughts. Brilliant tribute. Thank you, Mark. That was lovely. And a great tribute as well in the ground today uh, with the round of applause just before Mull of King Tyre, yeah. which sounded brilliant with a display. Uh, right, that does us nicely. We'll see you Tuesday or Wednesday uh, just before the Fulham game or just after. Uh, happy Easter to everyone. Um, have a nice break if you're off. If not, um, try to enjoy it. Uh, there's lots you can still catch up with Garibaldi Reds over the next few days as well. Uh, remember, we did a nice in-depth chat with a sports financial expert, which we highly great. recommend you go and talk. Yeah, you thanks, Mark. Really uh, you go and you go and listen to, and he kind of delves into why. Forest probably feel quite harshly done by given the four points. But Forest hoping to put those four points behind them and start, well, try to start again with a win against Fulham on Tuesday night. We will see you next time on Garibaldi Red. Like, share and subscribe across YouTube. Give us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts if you do enjoy. Have a brilliant rest of your week and we will see you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>